Welcome to the 252nd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Sarah Doby Bauer, best-selling author and book nerd, and author of the Bite Somebody series and the Escape Trilogy. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Sarah Doby Bauer, author of the novel Bite Somebody. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. Well, can you read a couple of pages from Bite Somebody? Sure, I will. Um, Bite Somebody is a paranormal romantic comedy. And so there's a lot of romance, but there's also a lot of comedy. So this is from a scene when our um, romantic interests first meet face to face. After the mermaid incident, she fell into a death-like slumber. She didn't wake until about 9 p.m., which was really late for Celia, who usually woke with the sunset. She wasn't hungover. She wasn't even sure vampires could be hungover. She sipped slowly on a bag of blood, her stomach still lacking confidence. She put on her soft Minnie Mouse t-shirt from the night before and felt bad for herself. Then, halfway through her pint, the smell. Woodsy B.O. guy was right outside her front door. Knock, knock. She wanted to hide. Her canines descended on their own accord. They'd never done that before. Apparently, from what she'd heard, it happened whenever a vampire was hungry or turned on, but Celia drank enough to never be hungry, and her sex drive was somewhere in the negatives. Yet there they were. The damn pokey things had escaped their caves. She put her hand to her mouth. Then, his voice. Mermaid, are you alive? Oh my god. She sprung to her feet and dropped the bag of blood on her bedroom floor. Sudden panic made her canines retract, at least. But still, she couldn't answer the door, not with him out there smelling like that. Mermaid, he continued to knock. Celia lay down on the floor, as if the man could see through walls. I'll call the police if you don't answer. Tell them I smell a dead body. Just what Celia was scared of, the police showing up on suspicion of a dead body only to discover blood all over the carpet. She stood and found her robe. She draped herself an oversized plush and took a long sip from her spilled blood bag before slowly approaching the front door. She leaned her nose against it. I'm fine, thanks, she said. She could feel him out there, the heat of his ear against her door in the shape of a seashell. I need visual evidence. No, really, I'm fine. She scratched at the door like a dog wanting to be let out. His smell, oh goodness, that smell. Celia was warm and out of breath. Come on, mermaid, I won't leave until you open the door. She opened the door just a little so he could see the side of her face. Hey, he said. The scent of weed from the night before had covered most of his normal smell. Then Celia's panic. In that moment, his smell attacked her full bore. Once, when she was going through a really fat phase, Celia gave up pizza for a week. Then her stupid parents ordered delivery, and she almost tackled the pizza guy because that pizza smelled so good. That was how she felt, like tackling tall, dark, woodsy. So, I saw you naked last night. She closed her eyes. Yeah. I brought your clothes. He held up her discarded ensemble, neatly folded in his huge hands. Celia reached through the three inches of open door and tried to pull her clothes inside. She had to open the door a little more to get her jeans. I'm Ian, he said. I just moved in. Don't stare at his neck. Don't stare at his neck. It was a really nice neck, long and thin. His Adam's apple bounced when he swallowed. (sighs) Shit, she was staring at his neck. Celia, she blinked. I'm Celia. It's really dangerous to swim alone at night. You know that, right? I was drunk. Yeah, well, don't do it again, okay? She chewed her bottom lip. I like swimming at night. 
Ian glanced toward the sea. He had nice cheekbones and a freckle on his throat. Don't stare at his neck. How about next time you take a dive, you come get me so I can make sure you're safe. She felt tipsy on his smell and his sympathy. She'd known the guy for five minutes, his scent a bit longer, and he already wanted to keep her safe. Celia had known her parents for 20 years before they died, and the only thing they worried about was her cholesterol. The most terrifying thing? Ian was way out of Celia's league. He was surfer boy cute, tall, lean, spindly. His hair was wild, like a nest of black baby snakes wiggling in the sea breeze. In the fake illumination of their nighttime apartments, she couldn't really see the color of his eyes, but they were big and crinkled on the edges, permanently amused. And he was worried about her. All this put together made Celia's canines descend again. She covered her mouth with her hand. Okay, thanks. When her fangs came out, she spoke with a slight lisp, so thanks just really sounded like a hiss. She closed the door in his face, locked it, and raced to her bedroom to finish her bag of A positive. The end. Great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about Bite Somebody yet, how would you describe your novel? Um, well, at its simplest, it's a vampire paranormal romance, but it's about a vampire who's awkward. I mean, you know, we, we have this image of vampires as like smooth and and all gorgeous and really charismatic. Well, Celia gets turned into a vampire expecting the same to happen to her, but instead she's just still awkward and chubby, just more pale. And so it's about this vampire girl trying to find her first bite, find her first love, uh, find her confidence. It's so it's kind of like in an awkward, weird way. It's a coming of age story for an immortal, awkward vampire in Florida. <laughs> do, um, you, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing bite somebody? Oh goodness. Um, I mean, kind of. I've always loved vampire stories. I've always read vampire stories. And I go every year to a place called Longboat Key in Florida. Every April, I spend a week down there. And um, just the laid-back attitude of Longboat Key and the fun I have down there kind of inspired this idea of a silly beach vampire. Because, you know... Why on earth would, you, would a vampire live at the beach? But I thought, well, that's part of the comedy of it. She lives at the beach. Um, she only swims at night. But I think also it had to do with my own awkwardness around guys that I like. I mean, I'm married now, so I found a guy that hopefully I'm pretty comfortable with at this point. And I, when I say dumb things, he just kind of laughs. But in the past, I was always super nervous if I liked a boy and I would just become this total idiot. And um, so all of that put together kind of created Celia. You know, she became an earlier version of myself. And um, so mixing that part of me with my love of vampires, with my love of Longboat Key, it just kind of blossomed. And it started out as a short story and an editor suggested, hey, you know, this is really great, but I think it should be a novel. And then it became a novel. And and as you just just described, there's this, uh, you know, there, you're you're playing against kind of the the a lot of the vampire tropes by bringing in kind of the awkwardness and and romantic, you know, comedy. Um, was was it a process for you to kind of arrive at that style and tone? Um, for Bite Somebody, or was it there from kind of the first page of you working on it? It was there from the first page, just because it's how Celia is. You know, the, the first draft of the novel was actually her journal. And so it was so easy to slip into that comedy because she's so funny. And so that made it really simple. And it's also, it was easy to get the tone and the comedy right just because the situations are so absurd, it's hard to not you know, be laughing at the things that she gets herself into and the things that Ian says. And there's a 
kind of the evil sidekick, Imogene, uh, is another vampire who's kind of trying to teach Celia the ropes. And Imogene is so over the top and rude and just says things that no one should say out loud. And so I think the characters made the comedy very easy, as good characters tend to do. Sure. So what was your writing journey prior to you writing Bite Somebody? I mean, how did we get here today? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, it's a long journey. Okay, I, so. I'll, I'll save so, I'll save you from some of it. Um, I have been writing since I was a child, and then I went to college at Ohio University and got a creative writing degree, and um, then I became a professional or whatever. I went corporate and. Uh, didn't and I said no I'm not going to be a writer that's stupid writers don't make any money that's just a dream it's not realistic and for years I fought to not be a writer and then eventually I um, was so miserable that I had to quit my job and become a writer and um, lucky for me it's worked out because I became a journalist first um working for newspapers and then working for she knows.com, which is a women's website. And then I started publishing short stories and writing novels and, um, writing marketing copy as an ex publicist. I was always very good at, at, uh, you know, weaving, weaving crap into gold, I guess. And so, I've been writing professionally now for seven years, um, and that's all I've done. I've published many, many short stories, many nonfiction essays, lots of columns online about books. Um, and, yeah, but Bite Somebody is my first official book novel out there in the world, and it's been a hugely exciting dream come true experience, and um, it just will continue because there's a sequel. I was just about to ask you if you're writing another novel now. Well, I'm <laughs> I'm on a break for the next um until June thirtieth. I gave myself <laughs> I gave myself about a week off. Um I already finished the Bite Somebody sequel. The Bite Somebody sequel is done and um with first readers. So I'll be doing the rewrites to the Bite Somebody sequel on June thirtieth. That will begin. But um, I just finished writing another novel two weeks ago. That's a totally different world, different tone. It's not a comedy. It's a drama. And uh, that is already under contract and will come out next spring. Um, But, yeah, I'm trying to take a little bit of a break from writing, from starting a new novel. I'll probably start writing another new novel this fall. I think is the goal. I just want to give my brain a little bit of space between projects and then I'll probably start another novel in the fall. Great. Well, what advice would you have for aspiring writers who might be listening and are interested in writing their own novels or short stories? Um, I know that, I know that it's said that it's not, a. It, people say it's not a good idea to write in a vacuum. People say it's good to, to share your work with others and get feedback and, and to care about what other people think. And I call bullshit on that. I do not agree with that statement. I think when you're working on a project as a writer, you need, you need to be operating in a vacuum. You need to be writing every day and writing your way, your world, without any outside input. Once you have that first draft, then you have to go to first readers. Then you have to share it with people because you they might see something that you missed. But I find that it's very destructive. I've seen it in writers' groups where new writers will bring the opening chapter of their new project, and they'll share it with a group of experienced writers and they'll just get trashed. And I think it's frustrating for them. And then they just stop. They give up. And so I think it's really important for new writers 
um, young writers, any, you know, any age, just new writers to create their own world, create that novel in its entirety. And when it's finished, then you can share it with people. Um, I also the think the best advice I can give is you got to have really thick skin and delete those rejections and just keep going and keep moving. And it's so easy to stop and feel bad about yourself in this industry. If you just keep going, keep pushing, keep believing in your work, that's the most important thing you can do. Sure. So when you sit down to write, are there ever days that you need to do something to jumpstart the writing process for yourself? Sometimes. Um, I have a very OCD morning routine that uh, it's a good thing my husband goes to work at like at seven because he probably, I mean, it's just, <laughs> he'd probably think I was really weird. But um, every morning it's get up make tea, waste time on Tumblr, listen to some music. Um, and all of those things, I'm a very visual and auditory person. So I like looking at beautiful pictures and beautiful people, but I also like listening to music and music can be a huge inspiration for me. So if I am, so I always build soundtracks for novels, bite somebody has a soundtrack and everything I've written has a soundtrack. And so if I'm, Having If I wake up and I'm having trouble getting rolling that morning on the current project, I will go to my soundtrack for that project and listen to certain songs that represent the tone and the feel of that project. And those songs will get me going. And I don't, I don't know if other authors do that or not, but it's a really important part of my process is to integrate music into the writing process. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, you mentioned earlier that you have done a lot of book reviews and written about um, books online. Uh, are there books that, that you've read in the last uh, year or two that you uh, really enjoyed and that you would want to mention? Um, of course, always. Uh, I read so many books. I love reading books. There's one in particular that's coming out in July, so it's not out yet. But it is um, by Tiffany McDaniels. And it's called The Summer That Melted Everything. And it is, uh, it's very heavy, but it's gorgeous. And it's her first book. And I'm very proud to have her on my blog in July. But it's called The Summer That Melted Everything by Timothy McDaniel. I'm also a huge Christopher Buhlman fan. He gave me a blurb for Bite Somebody, which was so kind of him. He's written The Necromancer's House, The Lesser Dead, and Suicide Motor Club is his new one that came out in June. He is much darker than me. It's funny, too, because I write comedy a lot. Most of my stuff is kind of comedic. And even if it's not, it has some dry humor. And Christopher and, and Tiffany are very, very dark it's like I enjoy reading that stuff, but I don't. I can't create it like they can. So they're two of my favorites right now. Great. Well, where can people find you online if they're interested in learning more about you and your books? I am everywhere. <laughs> um, my website is saradobebauer.com. And if you go to my website, you can find links to everything. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Google Plus, Tumblr, Pinterest. I even write fan fiction. And so if people want to <laughs> read my silly fan fiction, they're welcome to do that too. I like to retain a really big online presence because it just feels so important. It's it's just a fact of life now being a writer, you have to have a huge online presence and post often and post intelligently. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm very easy to find. <laughs> Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Sarah Doby Bauer, author of the novel Bite Somebody. The book is available now in bookstores, so go grab a copy. And Sarah, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you for having me, Jeff.
Almost 90% of women have cellulite. And guess what? It's not their fault. We don't choose cellulite, but we can choose a different way to treat it. Meet Quo, Collagenase Clostridium Histolyticum, AAES, the first and only FDA-approved prescription injectable for moderate to severe cellulite in the buttocks of adult women. This non-surgical treatment is injected by an aesthetic specialist in 10 minutes or less. Individual results may vary. Do not receive if you are allergic to any collagenase or ingredients in Quo or have an infection at the treatment site. May cause serious side effects, allergic reactions including anaphylaxis and injection site bruising. Seek medical help right away for any signs of allergic hypersensitivity. Tell your doctor about all your medical conditions, if you have a bleeding condition or take medicine that prevents clotting. Most common side effects include bruising, pain, hardness, itching, redness, discoloration, swelling and warmth at the injection site. Ask your doctor about all possible side effects and for product information. If you're ready to get to the bottom of your cellulite, learn more and find a specialist at Quo.com.